our panelists. We have five of them to come get settled while I introduce them. Now, you may not realize this, but you owe this group quite a bit. You do. It's because of this group that you can sing happy birthday and a video and post it without being in violation of copyright. <laughs> Corinne McSherry over there, she was part of a team from EFF that made sure that Woody Guthrie's This Land is Our Land still belongs to you and me. Why law and the public domain? I mean, isn't it kind of straightforward? Well, it turns out it is not so straightforward. And this group is going to explain it to you in all its variety. It turns out, right, that there are things that are born into the public domain. There are things that are fragile. There are things that um, are impacted by various degrees. Sorry, can we stop this? Oh, that's okay. No problem. I think we're missing one panelist. Joe Grotz, were you busy defending somebody? That, right, right, coming straight from the corner. Yes, yes. It is a complicated landscape, but this group is going to help us to navigate that. As I mentioned, Corinne McSherry, she is the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. All right. It indeed was Daniel Schacht, who was one of the lawyers who helped make sure that Happy Birthday certifiably is in the public domain. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer Urban from UC Berkeley School of Law. She helped make sure that a digital archive exists of the historical documents from the Civil Rights Movement. Thank you. <laughs> Our late arrival, Joe Grotz. He has been very busy defending our very good friend, Carl Malamud, along with Corinne. Thanks to his winning case, um, defending Carl, we now know that you can access state legislature um, laws that even have annotations and citations that you can't put those behind paywalls. So congratulations. <laughs> and finally, a woman who needs no introduction in this house, Pam Samuelson. She is a professor at law at Berkeley. She is the founder of the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic at Berkeley and many other clinics across the country. And she is the president of the Authors Alliance. Pam, take it away. So we're all very happy to be here today. And um, I think for our lawyers, it's very heartwarming to see that there are lots of people who love the public domain besides us. Um, uh, and so uh, we're, we're especially happy to uh, celebrate. And uh, while we are going to uh, have a set of questions and, and have some interactions here, um, uh, I want to make sure that you know that those little index cards, uh, you can fill them out if you have questions, uh, and people will be uh, wandering around to, uh, to get questions that you might want to put to us. Um, I know that um, uh, Mr. Copyright uh, was here earlier today uh, to answer questions, but, uh, but so are we. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to have a great group of panelists uh, to talk about um, uh, the law of the public domain, because uh, the public domain is actually a legal construct, and uh, people like us have to actually make judgments uh, about whether or not something is or is not in the public domain in the United States. Uh, fortunately, all those uh, 23 and earlier things uh, uh, that have been published are in the public domain. That's easy, uh, but uh, I think one of the things we're going to talk about is both obstacles to the public domain and also um, uh, uh, how we can try to overcome them. But before we get into those legal weeds, uh, we thought we actually would have wanted to start with uh, something kind of more fun, which is kind of today we're celebrating the, the birth of the, uh, the public domain through copyright expiration again. Uh, but uh, there are millions and millions and millions of works that 
uh, are in the public domain that maybe we don't think about uh, as public domain, but let's celebrate a few of those. And uh, I think, Jennifer, you wanted to I share a few things. Okay, great. I'm so excited I get to start because I'm going to talk about something that Professor Boyle mentioned earlier today, Section 105 of the U.S. Copyright Act, which is one of my very favorite sections of the U.S. Copyright Act. So <laughs> let's hear it for Title 17 of the United States Code, Section 105, which makes all works created, with a few exceptions, of course, I'm a lawyer, by the United States government automatically in the public domain. And what does that mean? That means that there are millions upon millions upon millions of valuable cultural and scientific artifacts that are automatically in the public domain. And as Professor Royal mentioned, this is not the case in every country. It's not the case in a lot of countries. Other countries will claim crown copyright or some sort of government copyright in their works. So it is an interesting and wonderful example of the way that our government has managed to be incredibly um, uh, insightful and have foresight for the future. We have a couple of examples that are visual. Um, just to give a sense of, of the broad range of things here, many people are aware that the Works Project, uh, Project Administration uh, during the uh, New Deal era uh, of the Depression sponsored a lot of projects around the United States to get back to work. The range of projects they sponsored and the cultural value of those projects is not always as apparent um, as it is from a few famous things. So they had, um, and this is um, an image of a couple of artifacts from this project, a national theater project that actually hired artists, it hired set designers, it hired actors, it hired directors, and it put on plays all around the country in order to put people back to work. All of the materials are in the public domain. Here you have a playbill from Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe and a costume design from the production of that play in 1935, which was directed by Orson Welles. The next image probably needs no introduction, but for anyone who um, can't see it, this is a very famous photograph called Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lange, um, which was also part of the New Deal uh, um, projects. This photo was in the public domain as soon as it was taken. And within weeks, it was in newspapers across the country, and the government provided food relief um, for the people in the migrant camp where the photo was taken. It has never gone out of the public eye, and it has provided the possibility and the sort of the uh, fodder for the public to discuss issues of race. The woman was at first thought to be white, but it turns out she was Cherokee. What does that mean? exploitation of the poor, poverty generally, and many other things. And that's because, in no small, uh, for no small part, it was born in the public domain. But this photo, I find, I mean, everyone knows Migrant Mother, but there are 170,000 plus of these photos um, from the 1930s to the 1940s. The one on the left here is a Rosie the Riveter kind of photo, but of an African-American woman, not the white woman we usually see. Um, and it's from the Office of War Information um, from 1942, I think. And the one on the right, I just think is hilarious because it's such a, such a stereotypical American cowboy, this is who we are um, kind of image. That is also from the Office of War Information um, in 1943 and was taken by the very famous photographer Lee Miller. So beyond these photographs, there's much cultural ephemera and cultural products. There are oral histories, many, many oral histories, including 2,300 from people who had originally lived in slavery. Um, there are all of the things that go with the plays, the histories, um, uh, reports on different countries. You were saying um, that you found the travel logs that the government produced really interesting. There's just masses of this information, all of which um, is available for all of us free to use. And then uh, the last visual, whoops, it, again, needs no introduction. Um, this is Earthrise, uh, taken by, I always have to look, I don't want to mess up attribution, I always get the astronaut wrong. William Anders of the Apollo 8 mission, one of the most important photographs um, of the 20th century. It has been called the most important environmental photograph of all time. But it also represents all of the scientific information, the scientific reports, all of the massive amounts of important 
um, information that the government produces and is available to all of us for free. So section 105 is my favorite non-term limit part of the copyright of the public domain. <laughs> I do have a favorite public domain thing, um, although it's somewhat contested at the moment. Um, but my favorite public domain thing is actually the law. Um, and um, but it's actually kind of important to, to, to notice it, because of course, laws have authors. People write them, right? Um, sometimes lobbyists, sometimes legislators, lots of people write laws. So they have authors, and there's a way in which um, you could have a copyright policy in which you would actually claim ownership in the law. Um, but of course, that would be a terrible idea, right? And law, I mean, I mean not just laws um, but like the Constitution, um, but also like judicial opinions and regulations and codes and basically all of the rules that we have to follow um, as members of, of the United States. And you could have a rule that said that um, someone could own that. But that seems crazy, right? Because you also have a due process right to be able to access the rules that you're supposed to obey so that you could know what those rules are. And if somebody could own the law, if they could have copyright in the law, then they could sell, you'd have to buy it, right? You'd have, a, have to pay money to have access um, to, to understand what your obligations are as a citizen of this country. So we have a sensible, thank God, copyright policy that says no. In fact, one of the, the earliest um, copyright decision from the Supreme Court started that tradition and said that, of course, judicial opinions can't be owned, can't be copyrighted. It's, uh, it's actually just one sentence um, this, the court says is the unanimous opinion of, of this court that the law judicial opinions cannot be copyrighted because it was so obvious to them. They didn't think they needed to like, write a big long thing about it. it was, of course you can't own the law. Um, but as I think we'll talk about a little bit later, um, that's actually become something of a contested issue um, at the moment. Should I talk about that now or shall we wait? Let's, let's wait. If we wait. Okay, but yes, the law. So Joe or Daniel, do you want to chime in uh, um, on this, uh, your favorite public domain? <laughs> I have a concept I'll mention, and I actually brought something. Um, one of the things I think that jeopardizes the public domain is when people create and, and try to copyright derivative works uh, as a way to use something that is in the public domain. And, and sometimes it's legitimate that you can add your unique original element and then you have a copyrightable element yourself. Um, and you get to enjoy that right. But this is from a case uh, where somebody, a, a toy manufacturer said, hey, you can't use this toy. Um, somebody was making similar products. And the court actually said, no, 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 this is way too similar to the actual Donald Duck that appears in print. And not that, Don not that Donald Duck is in the public domain. But the concept that I thought was great is, is this idea that, look, when you create a derivative work, you really need to, um, have something more, because we do need to protect the public domain. We can't allow people to make small variations um, and thereby recapture a whole new term of copyright. So um, that's my, my uh, thought for the day on, on public domain. Uh, so my favorite public domain piece of the, of the Copyright Act, unfortunately, isn't in the Copyright Act anymore in some respects. Um, we've been talking a lot today about uh, things that fall into the public domain through expiration of the term of protection, which is you know, why today is special, um, and things that were born in the public domain, like laws and government works. But there's, it, when we're talking about the 20th century, we can get a lot of things into the public domain and, and learn and discover a lot of things in the public domain um, through the, the operation of formalities. And we haven't, we haven't actually talked much about formalities today. Can we have three cheers for formalities? And then I'll, and, and let me tell you, now that you've cheered for them, let me tell you what, what I'm talking about, right? What, what I'm talking about here is uh, things like the requirement of notice. Um, or some way to cure a lack of notice, or something falls into the public domain if you didn't put notice on it. The requirement, uh, f for example, for renewal of a copyright registration after 28 years or 14 years uh, uh, in, in a, a long time ago, um, such that if you're not exploiting it, if you're not 
doing anything with it, if you don't care enough to show up and, and, and say, yeah, I still want it, it falls into the public domain for all of us to use. And one of the, one of the things I think we're going to be talking about, but my favorite sort of kind of public domain work from the, from the 20th century is things where formalities have expired because it, it makes my, my, my deep economist's heart happy that, that we were able to find the efficient solution, put a tiny cost on something, find out somebody wasn't willing to pay it, and then give it to the public. Yeah, so you used to have to, you used to, have to opt in to copyright by putting the notice on it. And really, for any work that's published uh, prior to 1989, if it doesn't have a proper copyright notice on it, it's in the public domain. So there's more in the public domain uh, than just the stuff that uh, comes from 1923. Just to add on to that, I represent a lot of musicians who obviously uh, do care a lot about copyright. But um, I think it's entirely appropriate to say that if you care, you need to take some steps to do that. Um, and I thought uh, back in the day when it was 28 years and then you have to renew, there's a real, you know, for economists it's a great idea because if it's, there's so many works out there that are, you know, the value is used up very quickly um, and, and we then benefit if they're in the public domain, right? The, the, we as a culture benefit when other people can use it. And so little things like that can really help provide clarity about what's in the public domain, but also still allow authors who do want to protect their works, give them the opportunity to keep that copyright. So I think from an artist's perspective, those are perfectly reasonable steps to ask them to take. So we're all people who like the public domain and defend the public domain, but I think we have to admit that sometimes the law puts obstacles um, uh, to the public domain, and so maybe we should confess, uh, not that it's our fault, but, um, but as lawyers we should confess that we're part of the problem. So, Joe, did you want to yeah. chime in? So, so returning to formalities, you th would think that these things would be easy, right? That is, even term of protection. When was this published? How, how can I count, how can I tell whether this was published in 1923 or 1924, such that I need to find some other reason it was in the public domain? Well, for a lot of things you can look at them uh, and you can just see, but that doesn't always work. And, and then for, um, uh, for renewal, for example, and other formalities, it can sometimes be hard to tell. Um, and it can be hard to be sufficiently sure. So one of the things that, that I think we as, as uh, that the legal system does less well than it could is giving certainty that once you sort of have a pretty good idea that something is in the public domain, that it really is. Daniel, I know you wanted to uh, say a few things about this too. Sure, um, uh, certainly the, the happy birthday case that I worked on, um, was part of that, right? It, 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 that's a song that came out in 1893 um, uh, by the Hill Sisters, you know, very, I, I think she should be credited for doing a great uh, piece of work there. Uh, but the authors, you know, who authored the lyrics is unclear. It didn't show up um, until maybe 10 years later. And it was part of a kindergarten movement. And, and my own personal belief is that it probably just evolved in, in classrooms as this song and others were used to commemorate special days. Um, so, but then it appears later in, in publications, but that were probably unauthorized. And if it's unauthorized, then it's still, uh, you know, probably subject to, to copyright. And it wasn't until we spent a lot of money and a lot of time, you know, four different law firms working on it, um, at the, in, in, in litigation terms, the eve of trial, uh, we got another document dump, and in that document dump was a uh, sheet music, and in that sheet music was a part that was blurred out, and we managed to find the original 1922 copy of it, and there it said, uh, there was this song, Happy Birthday, with lyrics, and then the part that was blurred out was by permission of the publisher. So we found kind of the smoking gun, but it took us a long time, a lot of money, a lot of effort to figure this out, I mean, certainly, this is not something that people should have to do in order to claim a work in the public domain. Um, very briefly, I also mentioned, I saw earlier, the Rosie the Riveter. If you look at Rosie the Riveter, I don't want to give Westinghouse any ideas, but that's a Westinghouse, um, it's not a government work, as I understand it. That was a Westinghouse print. It was done for internal uh, purposes. And then you, get the, you can get five lawyers with five different opinions on to, as to whether that's a publication. Uh, and so 
what are you going to do? I mean, thankfully, Westinghouse seems to have no interest in claiming that copyright. But if you come to us like a private practitioner and, and want clearance on something, you're probably going to get a maybe. You're probably not going to get a green light or a red light. You're going to spend a fair amount of money for our opinions. And it, it becomes a risk analysis that in many ways deters people from actually using things that probably are in the public domain. Jennifer Urban uh, has done some studies about orphan works and also about a guide to the public domain. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Sadly, I can only back up Joe and Daniel about the difficulty of actually making formalities work for you. The inimitable and brilliant Leela Bailey and I supervised a clinic project a few years ago where we created a guide to understanding whether something that you came across was in the public domain um, because of a lack of compliance with the formalities. And I'm here to say it is, it is an incredibly um, complicated situation. It is a particularly complicated situation for orphan works. Those works that have been disconnected from their authors or their owners, often because, as the economist Joe explained, they don't have an economic interest in exploiting them anymore. Therefore, it would be far more efficient, as well as obviously far more culturally valuable to make them available for use um, by others. But because of the fact that they've been disconnected from their owner, there actually is no way to clear um, those works. There is no way to go forward with 100% certainty. It would be very difficult to get a lawyer to give you, you know, a very strong opinion, and then you are existing in a world of risk of some sort. As you might guess from the photos that I chose, I think ephemera, the, the, the things of life, the diaries, the family photographs, the things that are most likely to become orphan works are incredibly culturally valuable. So this is really troubling to me. The other thing that I really worry about with the public domain is in addition to the late 20th century shrinking of the public domain, that we might start taking things back out. And I hate to be you know, the sort of depressing bad news bear here. But a few years ago, um, we did actually do that um, with Section 514 of the Uruguay Round Agreement Act, works that had been in the public domain for many years because they were created by foreign artists and we didn't recognize the copyright, were taken back out of the public domain. And despite a really courageous lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court saying that this was a First Amendment problem, that you would have to say that there is a vested public interest in these works and there is a vested speech interest that the public has in these works because they are in the public domain. The Supreme Court said, nope, that's fine. Congress can do that. They can remove these works from the public domain. Um, so that's probably my biggest barrier concern at the moment. Well, legislatures sometimes go ahead and try to make things like law into uh, proprietary stuff. And maybe you can say a few words about that, Corinne. Yeah, so um, so, yeah, so my client, um, Carl Malamud, uh, uh, has an organization called publicresource.org. And public resource is dedicated to making uh, government works available online to everybody um, in a more accessible format often. Um, so for example, print disabled people can ac get access to them. And as part of that, um, part of that work, he, has, he puts um, the law online. And um, over time, he has um, begun to get a lot of pushback from state legislators, um, for example, who claim copyright in, um, in their law. So the state of Georgia claims a copyright in the law of the state of Georgia and, um, and is trying to enforce that copyright. And there's a way in which that's almost insane, right? If you are um, a citizen of Georgia, surely you should not have to pay money to find out what the rules are that you have to live by. Um, there's something sort of so intuitive about that, but apparently not in Georgia. Um, so, um, Lots going on in Georgia, anyway. So, so it you know so it's turned into into, um, into active litigation, and and then there's another case. Um, where, uh, credit to um, Elizabeth Rader, who's not here, but she's been one of the and Vera Edelman of the ACLU. They've been working on that case, and then another case that Joe and I are working on. There uh, is another set of rules and regulations that are um, 
very, very actually probably the rules that we most interact with on our day-to-day -day level, which are just sort of basically codes, like the fire safety code, the national electric code, um, all the sort of rules and regulations that make our products safe, that make our homes safe, um, hopefully, if they're followed. Um, those are usually developed or often developed um, not by uh, legislators, but by standards bodies. They develop these codes and regulations and then they have them adopted into law. And once they're adopted into law, they're binding um, just like the Constitution or the tax code or anything else. But the standards bodies that own those uh, regulations um, believe that they have a copyright in them and that even when they're made into law, they can sell them and they can control access to them. Um, and then that is what they do. So um, public resource said that seems wrong to us. It's the law, and if it's the law, then there's lots and lots of cases that say the law should be made freely available to the public, that the people are ultimately the authors of the law, whether it's written by a lobbyist or a senator or a standards organization and then ultimately adopt it. Um, and there too, we've been involved in um, several years now of litigation, um, trying to explain to courts that there's a limit to copyrightability. And once something is made law, it enters the public domain. And I always sort of push back on that phrase of fall into the public domain, because it always seems sort of like it's sad, like, oh, it fell, too bad. Um, <laughs> You know, rather, it enters the public domain. It becomes part of our vibrant, common culture that sort of shapes our, our world. Um, so, that's the, that. We could go on. Uh, we with could go this on about that. Time. But the point is um, that so the courts are sometimes uh, and copyright holders have been an obstacle to um, to the public domain. But but that fight, those fights are not over. So I think we have to move on to the, uh, the last question uh, that I was going to put to you, and, and that is, uh, what is it that we can do as lawyers to help all the folks who want to get more things in the public domain? Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the various strategies uh, that, uh, that we as lawyers can recommend or help with? So I have two answers to that question. Um, one of them is uh, practical and highly unofficial. And one of them is perhaps impractical, but very official. Um, I'll start with the impractical one. Um, and that is, um, we just saw, as Brewster told us, in the Music Modernization Act, there is a ray of light in there. And that is that the, that leg the legislature put in uh, basically a safe harbor for non-commercial use of certain works that are covered by a, a provision of the Copyright Act. And we, that may reflect an opening or an openness or at least, at least the possibility of doing the same thing with respect to things that are probably in the public domain, right? That is, the public domain as an abstract matter is yes or no, but as a practical matter, there are shades of gray. And you shouldn't have to get all the way to yes in order to, to be able to be confident using something. So one thing, that, one thing that, that it would be great to see, both with respect to public domain determinations that might have been done in good faith, but might not be 100% certain, and de determinations of, of orphan work status, um, would be some kind of safe harbor, such that if, uh, if a rights holder shows up after you've been doing something, and they say, hey, actually, I own that here. I can, I can show you. I actually did renew that, and it was filed wrong and you didn't find it, that maybe you can stop or maybe you can pay a reasonable royalty, but they can't get statutory damages of up to $30,000 a work from you, and you don't have to be worried about that. So that's, that's the, the official, maybe impractical strategy. The unofficial, um, more practical strategy is be bold, right? If you're acting in good faith, people are not going, uh, most copyright holders are people of good faith who do not want to go after people who are acting in good faith, who are not harming their legitimate economic interests. And so if you're doing something, even pretty boldly, that is that, that you believe and have a basis to believe uh, and a reasonable basis to believe is in the public domain or is fair use, going out and doing it is the way, um, is the way forward rather than being endlessly afraid.
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in. Um, uh, Authors Alliance has been doing a lot to try to empower authors to uh, make their works more available through getting rights reversions. So if something is not commercially active, um, uh, very often, even if you've assigned your copyright to somebody else, uh, you can write to them and say, I see that you're not making any money from this and I'm not making any money either, so why don't you give me the rights back and I'll put it uh, up on a digital archive and make it available for people because there's still some good information in it. And so rights reversion and terminations of transfer um, are things that uh, the law really allows uh, people to, uh, to do uh, public domain dedication uh, through CC0 uh, after they've gotten uh, rights uh, reverted. So Daniel, did you wanna chime in? I did, uh, just to offer a slightly different that we want to be able to use material. I think the public domain is one, but also speaking as somebody who, who was an artist, uh, I played music for a while, and, and again, my clients are in that basis. Um, there's a lot, legislatively, I think, to Joe's point, to Pam's point, if, if you allow for efficient ways to, to allow people to use material, and if there's money made to compensate the original authors, uh, I think that benefits everybody. I think we see too much of one or the other. Either it's, um, it's far too difficult to, to determine if it's in the public domain, so you end up stuck. You can't set aside money that you think would be fair. On the other hand, you do find a lot of companies, a lot of very large companies, making a lot of money uh, that goes into their pockets when that should be distributed to authors, both of original works and to new authors who are doing more with it. So I think legislatively, if we make it easier uh, in that way, and my big, I'm a big fan of Section 115. If you want to do a cover song, you pay the artist. It's very simple. It's very easy. Uh, I think the more we do of that, um, the better off we are as a society, and the more we can, uh, more cultural works we can have. Good and uh, readily available, brilliant middle ground options that we've talked about today. Um, there are the Authors Alliance initiatives that empower our authors and artists. Obviously, there's Creative Commons, the brilliant idea that seemed crazy at the time to those of us who are copyright lawyers, but has really empo empowered people to make decisions um, to make their works available. Um, and there is the, I, over time, um, more usable form of fair use that has emerged in the courts as they have had more um, good cases to consider, to Joe's point, to take a risk. You need that good case law. But there are also the wonderful best practices and fair use by uh, Peter Yazzie and Pat After Heidi at the American University that re rely on a really robust um, method of going around to different creators' communities and finding what they need and developing a statement that is not 100% of fair use. It's not everything that you could do, but it is a reasonable statement of things that people in that community often need to do. And the more lawyers can help artists and can help historians and can help librarians with this sort of middle ground um, space, I think, the better. One thing that's really good about these best practices guides is that for the most part, they involve communities of creators and really what kinds of problems do they frequently encounter where fair use might be a, a good solution for them and then to provide some guidance with little scenarios about this is probably fair use if you do this and if you do this. And, um, and that then creates a community consensus about, uh, about fair use uh, that I think is very, very helpful. Uh, so, um, so do look at some of those best practices guidelines. I think they are very, very useful. Corinne, did you want to add anything in terms of sort of what can we lawyers do to help other than litigate? <laughs> Um, well, from my perspective, one of the things that lawyers could do to help is to stop sending DMCA takedown notices for public domain material. <laughs> Which I'm sure no one in this room would ever do, but we see it at EFF all the time. It's very, NASA pictures, for example, have received takedown notices regularly. And I think adding, adding on to that, and this is something that, that Corinne, you've been, you've been huge in, um, using, uh, using the tools that the Copyright Act gives us, like Section 512F, to fight back against 
um, encroachments on. How do we fight back against encroachments on the public domain? One way is there's a, there's a part of the Copyright Act, Section 512F, that says if you send a takedown notice uh, that you don't reasonably believe is right, like, for example, it's for that, right? You, you'll be liable for damages and attorney's fees. Um, and, and Corinne recently uh, won a very important case making sure that attorney's fees are in there so that the, um, uh, so that the consequences are real and there's the ability to get help uh, and deal with those when they're needed. Um, something that uh, I find very useful and I want to say is, is, is what everybody can do is, is what I see on Wikipedia when you've seen the analysis of the rights. Uh, it's a great starting point for lawyers when they're trying to tell their clients, hey, can I use this or not? Because trying to figure out when something was published, who, who is the author still alive, was the co where, where all these facts that you need to do your analysis, Wikipedia, there's a lot of great contributors who've done a lot, uh, and some of them really stake the public um, domain flag on works, which I think maybe from a legal perspective, you think, okay, a lit litigation might prove that different, but effectively, uh, it can be a very practical way to say, you know what, this is pretty low risk, and y you don't need to pay a lawyer to <laughs> just look at that and say, I think this is, uh, because of all the work that people have done to research that, um, it really can help push the public domain forward. So that's something that everybody can do. Okay, so we got a whole bunch of questions from the, from the audience, so I think uh, we'll get started with, the, with some of those. So I'm actually gonna answer this one first because it's really easy, um, and I like easy ones. Um, so please explain why all books from 1923 and earlier in the public domain, an earlier speaker mentioned 70 years after the death of the author, which seems to be a different rule. So that's probably a good one to make sure that everybody knows the answer to that. Um, so uh, prior to the, uh, the effective date of the Copyright Act, which uh, came into force in January of 1978. Works that had been created before then were uh, in copyright for a period of years, renewable for a period of years, and they didn't change that to life of the author plus 50 years. Uh, only the works that were created from January 1, 1978 going forward were life of the author plus 50 years, and then the Copyright Term Extension Act added another 20 years on that, which is why it's life plus 70 now. So, so the reason that we can celebrate the, the public domain is because we know that all the works that were published in 1923 are in the public domain period because it was a set period of time and another set period of time, and that's it. What, we, what we're going to have trouble with next century is that it's now life of the author plus 70 years, but how do you know? when the author passed away. And, and just to add on to that, it, it could be worse in that in, f <laughs> in, in France, as, 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 as you know, the, it's, it's life of the author plus 70, and, and it's been going that way uh, for a long time, but also in France the rule is not, you don't just have to figure out when the author died, but if they died for France, they get an extra 30 years. <laughs> So you have to figure out not just when they died, but how and why. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel. And, uh, on that point, from a practical perspective there, uh, at least in the music world, there are no US only contracts, right? You, 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 we're talking about US law, but it, these are international. You're gonna be in, distributed internationally at the click of a button through Spotify um, and other platforms. So it's great that it's in the public domain here, but if Mexico has life plus 100 and France, you need to figure out uh, if they died for France, it, it becomes a mess. So. so here's another question. In a world of proliferating digital artifacts and no formalities uh, required for copyright, how will the next century know what belongs to the public? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, question. you can look up, at least you'll know the publication dates from the Internet Archive and elsewhere, hopefully, <laughs> but, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> but, I mean, there's, there's something really, really important to that question that, that um, isn't confined to the public domain, but I think is why copyright has, become, has gone from being a relatively sort of sleepy legal specialty to, to something that's so important is, is because, you know, in a... In the world where we are now, 
you're create people are creating copyrightable works all the time and circulating copyrightable works all the time and but no one's but that's why really we miss the formality so much because for so much of this work no one cares no one, no one you're not thinking of it like oh i've created a copyrightable work that i now own and i can control and license like none of that's going to happen um, but <coughs> we create copyrighted works just in the course of our day um, and it's kind of crazy to sort of think that oh so we have to figure out what the legal regime is that runs all of these all of these objects Okay, so another question is, is the library public domain a recognized legal construct and what are its implications as decided by the case law, formulated by acts of legislature or procedural rules? Right, so the, so, so the library public domain was, was a term that, that uh, Brewster used earlier today um, to refer to the, the things that, the libra that libraries can do and that the Copyright Act gives, the r gives libraries the right to do that people who aren't libraries can't do or can't do in the same way. And so I would say, I don't think it would be necessarily right to think of the library public domain as a status, but it's a way of thinking about the additional rights that libraries have to do things and, and to act like some things are more like public domain works um, than, uh, than non-library actors. So in that sense, it's, it can be a, a useful concept, but I wouldn't say that work is in the library public domain. My, personally, myself. Although maybe it'll catch on. You know, <laughs> this is, maybe we will make that a thing. Yeah. Okay. So setting aside the current political climate, is there anything that prevents us, legal, social, or technical, from returning to an era of opt-in copyright? Um, if there was will, a political will, could we do this? If there were political will, we absolutely should do this. I mean, it would be the absolute best reform to copyright that we could possibly make. Um, I'm, finding, I'm finding it a little bit hard to imagine away the current political will, but let's do that, and it would be a tremendous thing to do. Well, there, there is a qualification to this. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, so, I mean, we, we may be about to say the same thing. I, 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 my, my, the first time I encountered this question, this was a question that uh, Larry Lessig got when he was speaking in 2002 at the I-Law that I went to at, right after college and before law school, and it just made my brain explode. It was a week of nothing but uh, cyber law, and Larry's answer was, if I remember it right, we just need to get out of the Berne Convention. The United States needs to withdraw from the Berne Convention this treaty that says basically you can't have uh, formalities, you can't have opt-in copyright. Um, and at the time, I thought to myself, you know what? I finally, I finally heard Larry Lessig say something dumb. Like, I, th this had never happened before. But over time, I have now grown to realize Larry was right. That, like, that, that's, that's an important piece of the answer. And the practicality of that important piece is beside the importance of that piece. Daniel. We, we have something like that already, because Bern is not self-executing, which means the text of Bern is not the law of the land. It is, it is what Congress chooses to implement. And so we already have great protections if you register your copyright, which can cost you $55. And the first question you're going to get when you go to an attorney and say, that person took my stuff, is, did you register your copyright? Because if you did, then I can send a nasty letter saying you owe us up to $150,000 and you will be paying my attorney's fees. If you do not, you will get a share of the profits. Uh, so there is something that we're already doing that I think could be built on. I think other countries will not be too happy. This is not too happy about these formalities that we still have. And we have intellectually dishonest arguments about why we use, we have them, but we're still compliant with Bairn. But we have them, so there may be ways to, to do this, to say, look, if you're in the mass of, you know, you, you doodle something on a napkin, you post it on Facebook, and somebody reuses it, okay, great. You, and if it's McDonald's and they make an ad out of it and make a million dollars, you should get a share of that. But you can't go knocking on people's door, uh, as we were talking about earlier, some of us, and, and send nasty letters about, out to everybody who's using it and demanding $150,000. So, so there is a mechanism that's already built in there that I think can be, 
expand it on and maybe even if we say, well, maybe you need to re-register after 28 years or you again lose the right for statutory damages and, copy and attorney's fees. Yeah, so I it is actually true that uh, the United States could basically pass a law uh, requiring opt-in for U.S. authors, okay? So the thing is that we can't, the Berne Convention basically um, stops us from doing that for non-U.S. authors, um, uh, but um, the political will to get there is not present right now, but you never know. May I amend, amend my answer just slightly? I was imagining the Berne Convention being washed away with everything else, but in a world where it isn't, which of course it wouldn't be, um, you can create an unfairness to U.S. authors, which I think is a concern. And the, the, But the way that I wanted to amend my answer was to say, we should bring back formalities, but we shouldn't bring back what we would call the traps for the unwary that existed with the formalities, which could make it much harder for you to get protection if you weren't sophisticated, if you weren't you know, backed up by a record label or something like that. Okay, so I've got uh, probably one minute left. Uh, it says, how, uh, the, a question is, how does the concept of moral rights intersect with the use of public domain works? Ah. Can, I, can I say something? <laughs> one, one of the, because again, speaking for artists um, generally, I'll, I'll just take that mantle. Uh, one of the rights they have is to say no. And I think that's, a, that's always a difficult question with public domain. Yes, there are many great uses that art can be put to, but there's also terrible uses that can be put to that artists and creators don't want to be used. So I think that's a, we do not have moral rights in this country, or, or very, very little, with very, very few exceptions. And we are, have an almost entirely economical model, and it's just something we have to live with. Well, people who care about um, attribution uh, do care about, um, uh, about the, even when the work is in the public domain. So um, it's a respect thing rather than a legal thing um, for us in the United States. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for this incredible legal panel.